Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Highway Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Bob, and we're up to part three with Simon Gray and his wonderful book. We've been talking about Suck It Up or Go Home. Correct? Yes. That's correct. Got you got it right this that, time, Bob. Third time Jordan. lucky. Yeah, typical Daft Jordan. Now, <laughs> there's something about that book I need okay. to bring it a task about. Okay. okay. I was looking at the it. book. Um, I still haven't finished reading it. Um, it's a, a hefty tomb, but it's it worth is. And it's good to read. You can keep dipping in it, uh, which I have been doing, of course. But on the cover, obviously, there's some guy sweeping a floor in a dojo. There's somebody looking uncomfortable in Cesar. Yes. Uh, and, and you've got, obviously, you've got your black belt on there. Um, but you're not, you're not got a gi on. Yes. You haven't had a shave either. You could have bothered with that. Um, <laughs> and you've got, a, you've got a T-shirt on, right? And I've been yeah. trying to work out what that is i'm not sure i've got an idea now i think okay now that i've looked at it what's yes, that about yeah. why have you got yeah. a t-shirt not a gi on that's a very good question you're the first person to ask me that so uh, okay. no prizes okay. but i'm glad you asked me the question because because i thought long and hard about what should be on the book cover and i wanted to convey a little bit of japan and i wanted to give, convey a message as to what i was doing in japan so if you look closely at the t-shirt i, I you know aikido you wear a, a, a gi the, yeah. the angry white pajamas yeah. but i didn't want to wear a gi but i wanted to show that i got the black belt in japan but if you look clef carefully at the t-shirt you'll see that it's a fairtex muay thai t-shirt is that is that so is that a guy with a monk on or yes it is yeah ah, so it's it's discreetly I... discreetly yeah. positioned you know like the um the old artists of the day they they paint a picture and they'd always put something slightly cryptic I wanted yeah. to kind of do that on a much lower <laughs> level on a much on a much lower budget um <laughs> So I, so I put that in there to see if anyone would ask me about it. You're the first, but also to show that I was doing other things other than Aikido. Yeah, because, I mean, we, we touched on it in either one or two, I can't remember now with the blog, uh, with the podcast, um, that you were still training in Muay Thai, obviously, yes. when you were in Japan. You took the opportunity to train at a couple of gyms there. Yes. Um, but, but. We've answered that question, like what's on the T-shirt. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, we left a bit of a cliffhanger, didn't we? Um, you did, yes. yes. Two, where you were going to start talking about something that sounded really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with Aikido and Jiu-Jitsu and about groundwork, I believe. Yes. Um, yes. And demonstrating your ability, shall I say, at groundwork. Is that what <laughs> they say? So something like that, yeah. Do you want me to tell you the story? Yeah, go on, tell me the story. Yeah, so I'm in, I'm in a traditional martial arts dojo studying Aikido, the Hombu Dojo in Ochiai, Tokyo, Japan. Yeah. And the majority of it, of course, was Aikido. But on occasion, and this is a very rare occasion, sometimes the instructor in the class would introduce some ground game or some striking stuff. And I always felt a little bit uncomfortable with that because, you know, if you're going to go and learn ground game you go to a jiu-jitsu school if you're going to learn striking you go to muay thai or karate or, or whatever else school yeah. and i always felt that if the instructor was trying to teach us the ground game okay they can teach us aikido but what really qualifies them to teach us the ground game in this particular yeah. instance so as you know i was training uh, elsewhere i was doing muay thai i think we're going to talk about that later mm -hmm. in tokyo i was also training at axis jiu-jitsu in Meidai mai so i was training there maybe twice a week, two or three times a week, whenever I could get there with my working schedule and Aikido schedule. schedule. So we got, we got this, I think it was this, 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 this one particular class where we had to try and, your partner had to try and pin you to the ground and you had to try and get up and, and that was the game. So it was, it was ground game in my, in my, my view. So I, I got it in my head that actually it was probably time to prove a little bit of a point that if you're going to teach an art, you need to really be deep into that art and understand that art and you can't really play it teaching a ground art if you're doing a stand-up art yeah anyway so um i was training with my my partner i kept him on the ground um i think i cut his lip or his mouth accidentally blood he had to disappear off sort that out so the seven and the assistant instructor came in and one of the seven in came in we played the same game and because i knew the ground you know i think i think i was a white belt but i trained on and off for quite a long time at that point so anyway, he tries to get up. Um, I get, I take his back, put him in a rear naked choke position, and with you know a squeeze, a, sque a squeeze of the arms, you know, you know the drill, a squeeze of the arms, you know, 10, 15 seconds could have put 
put the guy to sleep. Obviously, I didn't. But I wanted to prove the point that actually you've got to know which field you're playing on. And I think in the martial arts, you've got to know the game you're playing and understand the limitations of the game you're playing. So yeah. if you're a, pu if you're, if you're a pu purely striking art, you've got to have an acute awareness as to what may happen on the ground. And if you're a pure ground art, then you have to be prepared that the fight will start on its feet mm -hmm. and you have to do some striking as well. So I kind of wanted to prove that point. Anyway, the, assist the assistant instructor, the seven in, I don't think was particularly pleased because in the morning meetings that we had uh, every day when we were in a dojo, there was a very distinct point communicated thereafter that this was Aikido and we are not grappling experts. Now, I wasn't saying I was a grappling expert, far from it. No. But my view was, if you're going to put grappling into the syllabus, yeah. then actually, what qualifies you to put that into the syllabus? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you need to be qualified. Well, I mean, it, 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 exactly. Exactly. There was another incident. I've never heard of any groundwork in Aikido. No, no. A, 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 li a little bit. A wing expert said to me once at Combat Magazine a long, mm. long time ago, and it didn't take it nicely at all. I was mm. making a joke of it, as you know. I sort of, I like, I like to have a sense of humour about things. People take themselves too seriously, and he just said to me, because I was talking about clinch work, and he said, mm. "Oh, we do clinch work and Wing Chun." I went, "Well, uh, oh, right." He said, "We also do a lot of groundwork." I went, "What in Wing Chun?" He said, "Oh, yeah, we have to to keep up with what's going on." And my question, exactly like the same, the same thoughts as you had. Who's training? Where do you train? Mm. And he said he taught himself. So I lay on my side and did that. <laughs> I said, is this it? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. He never spoke to me after that. Yes. But yeah, people, people, um, you know, people come into my gym and say, oh, do you do groundwork? I go, no, nah, nah, that's, that's, this is a Thai boxing gym, mate. Nothing to do with working on the ground. I don't do yeah. that. If you want yes. to go to 10th Planet, it's just down the road. They're really good at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, um, but I think, uh, I think some people like to think because they're qualified, i.e. they've got their black belt or their mm. instructor status, that this suddenly makes them the master of all things, you know? Yes, so did, he, did he, when you choked him out, did he, did he tap? Did he know anything about that? No, no. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't apply the choke. No, I, obviously. I, I, but... I put it on and, and, and I let go because I, I, kind of, I kind of proved the point and, you know, that was... That was it. It, it was a, there was a, there was another instance in one of the classes where the instructor, the actual Japanese instructor, um, we were doing some some kicking or some punching stuff, and he, he invited me to try and punch him, or, and he would defend it. And obviously, punching in Aikido, a temi, is very different to punching in Muay Thai. Yeah. Um, and I kind of again wanted to send the message that actually. I've, at that point, I'd spent, what, 15, 16 years doing Muay Thai, so I could throw a punch. Yeah. Um, so you have to be prepared for the game you're choosing to play. And that, that, was, kind of my, that was kind of my point. And th there's something right at the end of the book. I won't tell you exactly what it is. You, you'll get to it. Uh -huh. One of the, the main instructors, um, I, was, I once asked the question, what do you think this guy would do in a ground situation? And I got an answer from one of his more junior instructors. Okay. And I give a response to that at the end of the book, which will be quite unpalatable, probably, to the Aikido community. But it's an honest assessment, having trained in the ground game. Yeah, well, it's, it's working within the rules of the system as well, isn't it? It's mm. like somebody in the gym said to me, um, you know, oh, you know, we, Thai boxing beats Taekwondo every time. And I go, well, yeah, because they have different rules and mm. it's a different setup. You know, it's like saying, you know, Shotokan Karate beats, you know, will will be beat an Aikido man. Well, I don't know. Will it? I, it probably, I, I don't know. Depend, uh, depends it, on the scenario. It, depends yeah. on the individual. It comes to the man. It depends on the, the dog, doesn't it? In the fight, it's always exactly. the size of the dog in the fight. Uh, and exactly. the, the dog, sorry. Um, and how 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 committed they are to to enacting violence upon you. Yeah. And I say this to people all the time. You know, I've got friends who teach self-defense and it's awful. You know, they'll get themselves hurt. Yes, and yes. My priority is always to teach awareness because then you don't have to fight. <laughs> you, you know, that's the ultimate, isn't it? Being able to yes. get away before, um, before the fight kicks off. Yes. So you've always got this. In, I've, I've had these sort of conversations with people before where they'll say, well, try and punch me. And I just don't want to. 
because you just think, well, you're not equipped to deal with it. Yeah, I've got a friend who teaches Aikido and he's a nice guy, you know, and I know that in his heart of hearts, he knows he couldn't have a fight. Mm, uh, mm. And if I put him with one of my guys who's only been training three or four months in Muay Thai, he get his legs smashed apart, you know? Yes, yes. Um, but it's different. It's not, it's not better or anything. It's just a, no. diff- it's a different thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a different interpretation of the, the martial yeah. um, way, if you like. They all have I their strengths. Yeah, they all have their strengths. They all have uh, uh, their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. I think you have to know what you're teaching and you have to know what you're not teaching. And if you, if you cross the line and blur the lines, then you have to be prepared that actually one of your students might actually know more about oh, yeah. The, yeah. the stuff that you're, that you're teaching. So, you know... That was kind of, the, the, the other thing we did on the, on the course now and again was we did stuff with Tanto with knife. Uh-huh. Um, so knife defense. And, you know, I felt, I felt that the knife defense was pretty primitive. And in actual fact, if I ever defended a knife on the street like that, I'm probably going to get cut. Yeah. If I want to learn knife defense, I'm going to go to one of the Filipino martial arts. You know, I'm going to go to, yeah. I'm going to go there. That's but the place to go. Weapons as a matter of course. Exactly. I'm going to go to a, an art that, yeah. that focuses specifically on weapons yeah. It focuses specifically on short range weapons. Yeah. So yeah. you've got to be careful. I was talking to Heiko this morning, uh, a German guy that he's on the podcast. Um, we're talking about dirks and cudgels and mm. things like that. short range weapons, edge weapons and cudgels, short weapons. And uh, we were saying the same sort of things. You know, you've got to train with somebody who knows what they're doing with this, preferably somebody who's been in a few knife fights. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they, they, they can get rid of all of the myths that exist within edge weapons and cudgels, of course. Uh, and, I mean, yeah, it's something that I love edge weapons. I've, it's my big thing. Um, and I see people who are giving, with scan, with very little knowledge and very little information, giving advice out to people on it. And you, yeah. You, you just hold your head. I've been doing martial arts for 50 years, Simon, and nobody, you're not an expert. You never can be, no. you know. It's about keeping your wits about you. That's the sort of thing I think um, doing a course like that you did, it sort of, it pushes you out of your comfort zone, yes. which a lot of people in the martial arts don't want to do. Yes. Why yeah. I think the book's sort of resonating with a lot of people. It's, they're like, you know, people are living your sort of their lives vi- through you, as it were, vicariously, reading the stories and yeah. living it in their heads. What they need to do actually is just go out there and do it. Yes. It's very yeah. few people will do. Yeah, and it, and it's not for everybody. I, I'm do, I'm recording the audio book at the morning. At, yeah, at the morning. At the moment, I meant to say this morning. What, what page um, are you up to now? You were twenty six. Uh, I'm I'm on, I've I've done what is it two four six seven hours worth of recording now, and I think I'm at page eighty. So I, I'm I'm really I know it takes forever. I'm reliving the whole experience again, uh, probably for the fourth or fifth time, having edited the book over and over again and trying to polish it to to as close to my version of perfection as I can get it to. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you know, since you've been doing the voiceovers yeah. for your book, the audio, yeah. I mean, are you thinking of changing it? No, because you've got to draw a line. When you write a book, you've got to draw a line under it. There's always extra stuff you can add. Yeah. There's always new ideas that come in. Mm. But I always think a book is at a point in time. You can't future-proof a book. Its book is written, it's published, That that has to be it. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of maybe grammatical stuff that I may change and tweak, but the version of the book that somebody would buy on Amazon today or elsewhere will be the version of the book in 20, 30 years time. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Like you say, it's a point in time. That's what exactly. Doing, exactly. Yeah. 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 So very little of that's going to change in. Yeah. All yes. you can do is write a book to, to further on, 10 years on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think this is... You could call the next one, sucked it up and came home. <laughs> yeah, I could. I could. <laughs> the, the, the amount of effort that's gone into this... And oh, yeah, the, you can see. It's, it's, it's not something you're going too lightly. I, I, the, re- the reason it took me 13 years to, to actually get started to write it and finish it is because of that arduous task that I knew it would be. Uh, and the coronavirus lockdown provided the opportunity. So, you know, yeah. you take you take something bad and you try and spin it to something good. Yeah, as it did for uh, quite a few people. Not a lot of people, but quite a few people made, you know, you sort of see the um, the silver lining and the cloud. Yeah. On. Well, hang on yeah. a minute, I can do this. Yes, exactly. Most people look at the cloud, you know. Yeah, exactly. Better to light, better to light a candle than to whinge about the darkness. <laughs> Correct. Very good advice. Very you know good what advice. I mean? I do, and this, yeah. is, this is the, the truth.
So um, there's something else I want. So we're talking about the groundwork there. Yes. All that you've done a lot of BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yes. That, yes. Uh, you train in Japan, obviously, with it, and you've yeah. continued to train in BJJ back home. Yes. Um, is it true? Uh, maybe right. it's I've heard that you're the only person with a blue belt in BJJ. Right. On in three con three continents. Is that right? It is right that I've got a blue belt in BJJ on three continents. Whether I'm the only person in the world, I'm not sure. I can't imagine there are many people that have got no, that. I, mean, I can't you, 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 you so probably wouldn't. The black belt, then you've got. <laughs> no, not not at all. If if anyone watching this who studied BJJ will notice that will will know that it is such a complicated, complicated. I mean, it takes ten years to get your black belt, and you've yeah. got to train oh, yeah. regularly. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, but it, but it is in the positions and it's, it's you know, the, anyway, anyway, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing to do. So I, I kind of started, started the ground game kind of not really pursuing any particular style or, or art, just, just doing the MMA type stuff in the UK. And then, um, when I went to Japan, I want to continue the ground game. So, uh, I trained at Axis Jiu Jitsu in Meidamai in Tokyo. Uh, before I left, I got my blue belt from Taka Sensei. So this was a, a Hicks and Gracie school. And then after um, after Japan, I went to Australia, and I trained with Professor Ben Hall at the Carlson Gracie School in uh, in Melbourne. And my my belief is always this is this is kind of what happened on the course because I went to Japan with a black belt in Aikido. Day one, you take your black belt off because I didn't get it at that school. So when I went to Australia, I said to Professor Ben, I said, "Look, I, I don't want to wear." A blue belt I'm, go I'm going to go back to white belt and I want to go on the journey with you to get my blue belt so before I left Australia I got my blue belt there and then I came back to the UK and uh, for quite a while now I've been training with um, Professor Victor Estima in Nottingham uh, and exactly the same when I you know it's a different it's a different it's a different school Gracie Baja school when I came back I didn't want to wear a blue belt I wanted to start the journey again so I've now got my blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu from Professor Victor so I've got my blue belt from Japan, Australia, and the UK, which, yeah, three continents. There we go. Does the, does the, the teaching style vary between the three continents? It's quite, I would say it's quite similar. Right. I'd say the teaching style is quite similar. Um, very much like Aikido, there are kind of softer styles, harder styles, different interpretations. And effectively, you, 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 you kind of see the art through the interpretation of your teacher. So it depends on your teacher what you what you see, but um, yeah, it's, it, I would say I would say there's a commonality to those three schools, but a slightly different interpretation. What I found in Japan, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu there was very complicated. There were lots of sequences with lots of moves and very very complicated, even for a white belt. Mm. What I found in Australia, it was very much about basics, foundations, doing doing things correctly foundational elements correctly and what i found in england uh the school i'm at now is there is a big emphasis emphasis on what they call fundamentals but there is that additional thing on top the more complicated jujitsu so what i found now is it's kind of the best of both worlds for me right um, right but i'm i'm um i'm a i'm still a beginner there's a long yeah. road to go so i kind of know that much and the people i'm training with know this yeah. much so, and you would say the standards are consistent throughout, you know, throughout the, the world, essentially. Um, I wouldn't say they're consistent throughout the world. I would say it depends on the, on the teacher. You know, if, you, if, you've had a, if you've had a teacher that has competed heavily and they've got a real competition focus in, in sport jiu-jitsu, you're going to get more of a sport feel. Yeah. Um, if, if, your, if your teacher's more aligned to the practical side, you're going to get more of a practical feel and then you probably want something that that, that lies between the middle you know one, one of the things i've i've never really been too bothered about in in brazilian jiu-jitsu is you know the points element you know if you do this you're going to get two points three points four right. points um because i don't really i've competed but i don't really compete now i'm more interested in the self-defense elements yeah. but then the sport game is linked to the self-defense element because you get more points for a better position so it all it's all swings and roundabouts yeah of course yeah so it's going to vary as you said yeah. between instructor i guess yeah. that happens in thai boxing clubs as well yeah yeah i mean i i'm i'm, I'm i guess i'm unusual <laughs> unusual again because i've i've trained 
and been um, a student of two Thai boxing schools yeah, course, with, yeah, with, yeah. with crew Tony Moore and, and, and Master Lek, Lek, which never happened in the day, particularly in a Muay Thai world where you're going to fight another school potentially. Yeah. I never fought anyone from Sitsayam when I was at Sinakon Chai, and I never fought anyone from Sinakon Chai when I was at Sitsayam, and I never would. Um, no, no. So I've been very, very lucky in that regard. But I've always had this belief in martial arts, and it's one of the reasons that I've never had my own school, because I, I believe in what you said earlier, that, that you, you're always a student. Mm. You're always a student. And I guess in the back of my mind, I never think I'm good enough to teach and I, I constantly if I have a choice to, to teach or to learn even at 48 years of age I'm still down the learning path well, yeah I find that obviously I teach a lot uh well I did uh, and um and I was starting to lose the student sort of idea yeah. well sort of when he's teaching all the time you can't train is what I'm yes. saying um yes, of course. and at one time I was literally living in the gym, you know, teaching back to back private lessons. And mm. it was just class after class, seminar after seminar. And you, you have very little time to do anything of your own. Yeah. Uh, but it, over the past year and a half or so, I've become a student, but it's Western weapons, you know, historical yes. European weapons. And it's yes. brilliant. I mean, it's just, I just love being a student, you know, cause you yeah. just, I'm a sponge, you know, I'm a bit like you, 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 you don't care i'm not bothered about grades or qualifications i yeah. just want to do the art with good people yes yeah it, right. it, exactly I, I think there is ego in martial arts i don't think there should be ego you know and whether you're a sixth dan seventh dan first dan in japanese martial arts everybody's got something to learn from somebody else oh definitely um and i think where i've always believed you know don't debate what works and what doesn't work off the map try it out on the mat or in the gym, in the dojo at the Muay Thai camp and work it out and, and evolve together to learn, to better the art. And that's, that's the way forward. It really, I think so. I think so. But that, I think sadly, a lot of these, the martial arts now, I think I might sound like a bit of an old man here, but they've become more of a business yes. than, than a martial arts place. So my, my, my gym is a pretty much sweat and store, sawdust gym. You know, I've got motorbikes down one end. And, yeah. and a ring and a small area to train. We can get probably 16 people in there. Yes. Um, you know, I'm never going to make a fortune out of it, but it's got an atmosphere where people come in and they're, they're there to train. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the kids love it. The parents love it. And the parents have all said, oh, it's proper old school, this, isn't it? Go, well, yeah, yeah. That's how I like it. That, that I, me, me too. Like me to have time to train as well, mate. Yeah. I think, uh, I think there's, a, there's a delicate balance between respecting the arts and the traditions of the arts and, and following it blindly mm -hmm. and asking the question, well, what if, what, what would happen if this happened? And, you know, if you walk, if you walk into the, to a dojo on day one, you've got to respect the art, you know, yeah. you're not going to challenge the instructor. What about this? Learn the art and then start to um, start to question it. You know, I, I, I followed the Muay Thai path that I'd been taught and the Muay Thai techni technique that I've been taught to the letter until I got my instructor's license. And then I started to ask myself a question. Well, okay, if I, you know, when you step, when you step to the left to throw the right kick, what if I didn't step as far? What if I tried this? What if I did that? And I tried to evolve my game to suit my body type and my understanding of what I'd learned. So it's like when you learn, um, you learn a language, you've got to learn the, the individual letters, then you learn the, the words and then you put sentences together and then you can articulate the language at your your freedom and, and become a writer like me um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's and it's the same in martial arts so there is a delicate balance but I do think sometimes in the Japanese martial arts from what I've seen even at the very highest levels where they're fluent in the language mm. there's not enough challenge and question and involvement of the art mm. that I think there probably should be you know, it's it's funny because this reminds me of a story that I heard well, when I was 15, 16. And it was my karate instructor I was talking about. It. He'd been to Japan. And the Japanese are, he said, in his eyes, the Japanese were uh, all about form. All yeah. about the form had to be exact. Even yes. at the detriment of, of um, uh, I guess, efficacy, you yeah. know. Is it effective? Well, oh no, no, the form's got to be right. And there was a there was a, an American baseball coach had written an article. He's gone out to Japan 
to train them because the Japs love their baseball, you know. Yes, um, yeah, that's right, yeah. And they love their American sport. And uh, he said he couldn't get it in their head that the, the, it didn't have to be in exactly that angle as the ball was coming. You didn't have to always. Sometimes you could lift your shoulder. Sometimes you could drop your shoulder. And he said, no, no, no. How do you do it? And he said, well, everybody's different. No, how do we do it? And <laughs> this was in the 70s. And he, he, he was frustrated with it. And he had to walk away. Yeah. He said, I could not coach them. Because yeah. they were after the definitive method of swinging yeah. a baseball bat. Yeah. Every angle of it. Every position of it. Yeah. And I remember karate being like that as well. Yeah, I you know, very much the same. Have to be exactly the same, but that's Japanese society to a certain extent, isn't it? Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's um, you know, getting away from the dojo. Obviously, I lived I lived in in Japan, lived in Tokyo for the best part of two years, and it's a uh, it's a very regimented society. Yeah. Um, what I what I found when I got to Japan in the first place was that, you know, you go into a, a new country with kind of rose tinted spectacles, and everything looked efficient everything looked to be orderly everything looked to, to to have its place and the longer you you live there the more you see the reality of what that actually means okay. and the dojo was um the dojo was dojo life and the dojo hierarchy was kind of a mirror to to normal society you know you had somebody at the top what somebody at the top said nobody ever questioned yeah now you have to respect and what japan are very good at doing is respecting their their elderly generation yeah. you know, there's a joke that I've heard before that it's the best place to retire because you get massive respect as, as, as an older person and looked after. Yeah. But, but you have to sometimes challenge the status quo. You know, there were various things in Japan that I write about in the book that you never would have imagined you would see in any country. Um, and they still existed in, in, in Japan. You know, that some things around about I'm a, I, I'm a gaijin, I'm a foreigner in Japan. And there were certain places that you still couldn't go because you were a, a foreigner in Japan. Um, and, you know, I was talking, talking to um, the, the lady who's doing my audio book with me this morning um, about, you know, being a female in Japan and what that, what that means, certainly what it meant at the time. Um, and, you know, those things that you didn't, you didn't see on day one, you started, to, you started to see as you lived there for a period of time. Yeah, because there's certain, there's definitely an inequality, isn't there, between oh, the definitely. In Japan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there definitely was back there, and I think, I think there probably still is. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's. It, I've said this a few times now. It's always a delicate balance. It's very, very dangerous to follow the leader just because they're the leader. Yeah, yeah. And so, and we did things in the dojo because the leader said we should do things a certain way that would be completely ridiculous and non-practical. Not 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 in terms of the technique, but. You know, just maybe things like how we go about moving the mats from the dojo to a, another location. You know, there would have been a simpler way to do yeah. this kind. Of, but but you, didn't, you didn't question it and you couldn't yeah. question it and nobody questioned it. And that's dangerous. Yeah. And yet, and the opposite of that, I guess, is Thailand, which is very relaxed. Yes. And yet yes. they've been hard and yeah. achieved the same ends yes. with a completely different approach. Yeah. More relaxed yeah I mean, a, 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 exactly exactly you know, totally to, to, to achieve greatness yeah. but in a much more relaxed sort of manner there's more of a sense of humor you know yes the teacher will tell you and, and out of genuine respect you'll listen to but i don't think there's any thai teacher i've ever met would mind it if you went oh can you can you not do it this way they go oh no no i show you and if they could i mean i remember pamu saying you know if if you can show me some of that would be great you know i like to learn yeah. you know and Pamu yeah. was always about learning new stuff. Yes, um, Com- completely different environments. You know, I trained. I trained at, at Carry Boy, as you know. I trained at Sassi Prapa. Yeah. Um, I remember going into Sassi Prapa gym in in, in Thailand, uh, and I took a friend of mine from the UK who trained with me at Sinakon Chai. It's his first yeah. trip to Thailand, and we got to the we got to Sassi Prapa, and we we get there. Everyone sat in the in the back. They're kind of just getting up for the afternoon session. And uh, he says, what do we do? When does the class start? I said, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> I, said, I said, just start skipping. Yeah. Follow me. Because I've been there before. So we start skipping. And t- 10 minutes in, he's like, why isn't the class started? I'm like, no, 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 no. They're, they're watching us to see how we, whether we're worth teaching. And then yeah. after about 20 minutes, the guys came out and taught. Yeah. Now, in, in Japan, 
his experience would be completely different. There would be a start time for the class. It would start on the button and it would finish on the button. But in Thailand, it's, it was very, very different. Yes, Brazil- I remember, and Tony Moore was there, and Tony Myers, and it was a meeting of, a, I think it was in the 96 or 94, I can't remember. Um, and it was a meeting um, with the Amateur Muay Thai Association of Thailand, Amtan, mm. and it was the first time they'd done it. And we all had to meet at a hotel, you know, the Russians, the French, the Germans, the Italians, the English. Everybody turns up, of course. Ties were late, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it was like, yeah. and I think it was Tony Moore who actually said, oh, yeah, Thai time, you know. Yes, yeah. Uh, half past eight, Thai time. Yeah. You know. It's the same, same with Brazilian the jiu-jitsu. Are there. You know, the Germans are like chomping at the bit, yeah. you know, like, where are they sort of thing. Uh, and And it, it's that, I mean, to a certain extent, I do that in my gym, I, not by not by design. I'll be like, okay, um, three minute rounds, and everybody looks at me and goes, yeah, <laughs> like that, because some of them are three minutes, some of them are five, some of them are four, and it's because you you're going around the class helping yeah, people yeah. and teaching them, mm. but everybody accepts it, you know, yes. um, and I like that attitude. And people still train, people yes. still put the time in, you know. Yeah. And you do see the people who are really keen. Uh, and, you know, the people who just want form or will end up going doing karate or something anyway. Yes. You know, if they want structure, my Muay Thai class is not the one that comes. It has a structure. I have a plan, mm-hmm. but it's very relaxed, you know. And, and the people who train hard are the ones who end up fighting. And the others are, obviously, they're involved. They're part of the team. Um, and we it's just a different it's just different it's different and i always yeah, I, I wanted to ask you that question right at the beginning but it wasn't the right time to ask yeah you know, the difference between southeast asian asian martial arts and japan very mm-hmm. very stark i think oh completely and, and probably the happy medium lies somewhere in in, in, in between i mean though the, you know thailand and japan are not a million miles away no um my experience of brazilian jiu-jitsu um you know there's such a thing as you talked about thai time there's brazilian time uh-huh. Um, you know, in the UK where I train now, it starts pretty much on the button, mm-hmm. not quite as strict sometimes as, as, as Japanese culture, but you know, I think, I think it depends on the culture. It depends on society. I'm more of an advocate, I guess, of, of the, the strict regime, the strict start, start time, the finish time. And I think it's pro- that's probably because I think in, in, in this country, you, you have to set those parameters yes, to, to, yeah. to have, to gain people's respect and to, and to gain. I don't know, a, a structured teaching environment. You know, I, I've done a lot of these webinars recently. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what drives me insane is I, I start the webinar always at the time that it's supposed to start. And then people come in three minutes late. Oh, I know. I know. So I've got to tell you, it just it's just disruptive. So for me, and I, I told you the story, I think, on, um, on uh, our discussion, first discussion, mm. you know, Crew Tony, when I, I've seen him in Manchester, uh, when I trained in his class, I did more private stuff, but I trained in a couple of his classes. I've seen somebody turn up a minute late and he sends them home. Yeah, yeah, you said. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm more in that camp. Yeah. Everything's I, clear then. Yeah, I think it's important in, certainly in business meetings, um, and I do a lot of work at the universities, and you get medical students, and mm. now these are supposed to be high-flying, high achievers, and you get fourth-year medical students who turn up like 10 minutes late and not yeah. even apologise, you know? Yes, yeah. And that drives me mad because that has to have structure in order for the students to get anything out of that hour. They have to be there at the beginning of the hour. And at the yeah. end, it's always the same people who turn up early, you know, they're yeah. ready. And you know, yeah. those people are going to be really successful. And the ones who are like a days ago, who are always late or leave early because they've got an excuse. You just think, and they wonder why they failed their exams at the end of four years, you know, and yeah. you just go, well, maybe if your time came, it have been a bit better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it costs cost you nothing to be on time, no, and you you, you no. get you get this slippage, don't you? You know, if if you know back in the in the in the martial arts school, if people turn up five minutes late, and then the majority start to turn up five minutes late, then everyone thinks, well, everyone turns up five minutes late, so I'm going to turn up, and suddenly it just drifts. Yeah, it slips. Were, the time yeah. slips. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, I've seen this happen so many times. Um, my kids' class, uh, the parents have said because a lot of them have been to kickboxing and things like that. They said, so what time do you start? I said, six o'clock, like on the dot. And they go, all oh, right, um, we might be a bit late. I said, well, I, I said, we start at six, like, and of course, 
like you say, if I'd started going, no, nah, nah, don't worry about it, don't worry about yeah. it. I mean, the training's very relaxed, but we like to finish on time, start on time. And even yeah. more so now, because obviously with the COVID thing, you've got to clean the place up. You've got a defined period of time. You finish one class, you've got to be, everybody's got to get out. I quite yes. like it, actually. It's very Japanese. You yeah, get yeah. everybody out, and then yeah. you clean the place. Yes. And I yes. missed a trick, really, because one of the dads said, why don't you get the kids to clean the place? <laughs> there you go. There you go. This is what they were doing in Japan. <laughs> yeah, they definitely. They, oh yeah, not... I did it when I was a kid in the dojo. You clean, you clean the dojo afterwards. When we finished the class, everybody yeah. was up and down the floor cleaning. Yeah, it. yeah. I, 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 I still have um, I still have a thing to this day, that at the jiu-jitsu school I train at in Nottingham. You know, if I see one of the professors sweeping the mat uh -huh. or cleaning the mat, you, you I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I feel very uncomfortable about that. Yeah. Yeah. But but I know that I have to leave because of the health and safety requirements surrounding COVID. If if I see if I see my professor carrying a bag, I feel like I have to go and take the bag off them and carry yeah. it because yeah. because that was drummed into me. But I think that's just manners anyway, and I think it's something that we've lost in British society. This mm. you know respecting your elders, you know. Yes. I mean, even to this day, you know, if I see an old woman crossing the road, I'll go and help her. I'll stop the traffic yeah. and help her across. Not many people do that now. No, no. And I would give me seat up. You know, if I was on a bus, I'd give me seat up. It just, it just, just being nice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's... and you think this person's worked hard to get to that level. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take, come here, let me, I'll sweep that. You don't yeah. need to do it. Yeah. But that, standards yeah. have slipped and standards yeah. of behavior have slipped and it's, um, yeah, it's a different. It's a different. It's a different world. It's a yeah. different world we live in. Uh, so, we've sort of linked to the tie now. Okay. Whilst you're in Japan, you obviously train, and you went to train at Fairtex. Yes, I did. Yeah. Um. So tell us a little bit about Fairtex because I remember Fairtex as a brand starting. Yes. And then they started opening camps in Thailand. Yes. But yeah. I wasn't sure <laughs> at the time how good they were going to be. You know, because we were very. They seemed very commercial i mean you've trained in one of them i haven't so what, what was it like yeah. their text camp do you want to just jump back to the first place i trained oh sorry in, yeah Ihara gym. yeah the Ihara gym because it kind of it tells its own logical oh, story no, fine. yeah you okay yeah yeah so when i got to japan before i started the century state course i wanted to find a thai boxing school yeah so you, you kind of Google, but the Japanese website's nightmare because it's not in English. So you, you, you kind of, you try and get a recommendation here and there. Anyway, I, I remember, um, I remember walking down the street uh, in a, in a bisu, which is you know, sent pretty much central Tokyo. And I heard the sound, you know, the sound of the Thai gym, wham, wham, all this kind of stuff. So I went in and this was, um, this was a very, very Japanese type kickboxing gym. It's called the Ihara Dojo. Um, they were the guys that, that had the K1 fighters. So people like Masato, um, Masato trained there. So I'd see Masato train on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. They had Bob Sapp fought out, <clears throat> fought out of there. Not sure if you remember him Yeah, back in the K1 days. Yeah. Um, so it was very, very Japanese, but, but, but that time, and I talk a, a bit about this in the book, the Japanese realized that in the, in the, the, the kickboxing or the striking stakes, they were behind the ties. So what they would always do is bring over ties from Thailand. Mm -hmm. So at the Ihara, Ihara gym, the, one of the first guys I met was a guy called Nopadet, who was the Rajadam Nern champion. Yeah. Um, now if, you take it with a pinch of salt, you know, he's the Rajadam Nern champion. But then I remember taking a trip to Thailand and going to Rajadam Nern stadium and mm -hmm. seeing his picture yeah. as the champion. So it, it was the legit, the legit article. Yeah. Um, but the problem with that, that gym, that dojo was, Press and media were always there. Um, you, you you couldn't get a spot to train. It was very Western because all the Westerners came in, and right. I I, I kind of craved the the more authentic Thai gym that yeah. I found in in Thailand. So I decided to leave that particular that particular gym, and I I, lo I looked out for a Thai brand, a Thai name that, that I might know. And I found Fairtex gym. I can't remember exactly which part of Tokyo it was in, mm. um, but it wasn't too far from the, um, the Aikido dojo. Um, so, so it was a similar setup there. You know, it was on a, on a, on a street, they got a, a Japanese manager and then they got a Thai trainer over from Thailand who did, right. who did not classes. You kind of just turned it whenever you wanted. Do your skipping, do your bag work, do your shadow boxing. 
right. and then the trainer would invite you into the ring to do some pants but it was all very relaxed it always makes me smile the, the irony of this place was the, the name of the uh, the name of the trainer was choke so it would have been oh. better at, it would have been better at the the jiu-jitsu gym but um <clears throat> it's kind of you had to build that relationship with the trainer um and i enjoyed my time at um at fair Tech. it wasn't particularly structured no. um but it was it was it was good it was good training but what i found the difference between japan and the difference between Thailand, it was very much a commercial operation mm. in Japan. So I remember I didn't train for, I think it was a couple of months, two or three months because of the Aikido took over. Uh, and I went back to, I went back to Fairtex and said, oh, I'll come back now. And you pay a monthly subscription. Right. And they wanted me to pay for the three months that I hadn't trained there. And I wasn't on a contract or right. anything like that. And I kind of had a bit of a, well, that doesn't seem quite right because it wasn't, particularly cheap yeah. so it was more commercial whereas in, in 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 thailand you know sometimes they never even ask you for any money no, no. you know you, you just turned up and i i didn't tell you this story on the um on the first on the first session we did together yeah but carry boy gym when i trained at carry boy gym you know i remember having to force them to take some money for my mm. training and then after training they took me down the street and they, and they took me for dinner and, and never accepted anything in return now what I don't want is a free ride. No. Aha. Uh -huh. Trainers hadn't have been there, I wouldn't have probably trained there. Mm. You see this free ride thing as well. I mean, I, I, I feel the same way. Pamu was a lot like that. So we had a bunch of guys over there uh, from Wales and, um, he eventually accepted their money <laughs> you know yeah. they, we need to pay you for the couple of weeks we're here we need to pay oh no problem no problem anyway we paid them up and then he we went out one evening uh and the, it was the guys who wanted to go out and so Pamu said he knew a good little restaurant nearby and we all went down there and there must have been about 12 of us something like that and um i, I said to Pimu, I, I said we need to pay now tell me how much no, no, it's paid. I went, what? I said, no, no. He said, yeah, I have paid. No problem. I said, well, I, we haven't even paid you for staying at the gym yet. You, how, do, how do you mean you've paid? Because I knew he didn't have much money. And he said, yeah. ah, credit card. <laughs> I said, so you're, you're paying even more now. You're paying even more with interest. Yeah. yeah. He said, no, it's okay, okay. And the Thais have got that funny attitude, you know. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in Thailand, Muay Thai is about, it's about survival. Yeah, you know, absolutely. People get into, in, in, in Japan, it was about, you know, commerciality. I want to I wanna be the, the K1 champion. Yeah. Do yeah. I want to be the K1 champion because I love K1? And, and, and it's, yeah, probably, but, but there's, there's, there's bigger money attached to it over there, and big, big money. Um, well, I mean, Bukau, Bukau left Muay Thai to go to K1 exactly. purely because he could make more money, which I, I can understand completely, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah exactly. If you come from an impoverished country like Thailand and you're a boxer, you haven't got a lot of money and somebody gives you the opportunity to make money. Well, yeah. you know, and he, and, he, and he has, of course. And I, I mean, he gets a lot of criticism. I mean, I, I don't particularly follow K1, but... Um, I just say, you know, Thai, some of the dyed in the wool Thai boxers will say, oh, he's a bit of a traitor, really. You know, he's got, I went, well, he's not a traitor. He's making a living. He's, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it's okay for us in the West to sit back and go, look what he's doing. Hang on, put yourself in the situation. You live in the third world. The only skills you've got is punching people. Yeah. And who's paying you the most money? Oh, they are. Right. Okay. Exactly. That's where I'm going to go. It's as simple yeah. as that. Exactly. Exactly. So, so you weren't, you weren't, um, you weren't sort of too pleased with the, 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 the way Thai boxing, I mean, you trained obviously, did you get anything out of it at all? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the stuff that I got out of it, I mean, it, it, it felt a little bit like training in Japan in a, in a, in a Muay Thai gym that you kind of go, you do your own thing. You might get pulled onto the pads to do some stuff, but yeah. You'd hit the pads. You didn't really get taught anything. Whereas <clears throat> my experience in Thailand is, yes, you'd still go and do the skipping, the bag work, the shadow boxing. Then you get in the ring. But then you'd find 
a trainer would would come and, and actually show you specifically okay yeah. you need to do this better that better i didn't really if i had gone to that gym either of those gyms wanting to learn how to strike with no previous knowledge mm -hmm. i'd have got nowhere no no i'd have got nowhere yeah so that's the difference well, I think. yeah it's um i suppose like you say it's this commercial thing isn't it yeah uh, it stymies yeah. the opportunity for people to learn to fight yes because yeah. obviously a fighter needs a lot of attention yeah. especially up and coming fighters mm -hmm. and if you're being asked to keep paying and keep paying and keep paying to learn more to become an effective you're not going to be able to sustain that yes i know i know with my lads you know um I've, and, and i'm sure it's happened with lek and tony where you've got really good guys mm. who suddenly vanish from the class and you find out they're not coming because they haven't got any money yes and i used to drag them back in and say look lads look everybody's you you know everybody knows you would come if you had the money just get yourself back to the class we can always sort that out later yeah. you know and it's it's nice to have that attitude to, yes. to training yeah it is and I, I found i've definitely found that attitude in in muay thai you know crew tony you know obviously i paid for for, for training but I, his motivation was was the art yeah master, master lek motivation the art yeah um in japan commercial even 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 the ike if, if you think about the the premise as to why the century Day course was was created why yeah. this aikido course was created you know we paid for the privilege of doing the course but the end product of the course and the instructor's license that you got at the end of it the idea was that you would go and open a school of course. somewhere in the world and then you have an affiliate to, to the yoshikan honbu dojo you pay your fees and so it's, it's a business at the end of the day so it was a franchise and, uh, effectively because for, for certification of your students yeah, you pay cool. you, you you know you'd have to have an association with the Hombu dojo in tokyo yeah, yeah. now they they kind of went about it the wrong way because i think in my year out of 13 people only three or four actually stuck stuck with aikido afterwards uh -huh. so anyway had a particularly bad year something clearly went wrong yeah. um you know they didn't maybe they didn't maybe they they didn't maybe sell it as well as they um as they could have done and we so the empire would crumble <laughs> well as, as, as you'll have read about there was some strange goings on during my year that um, yeah i think maybe put people off and um you know i'm still carrying carrying an injury in my knee some of that is maybe from from thai boxing but um i think the majority of it from my time in japan uh-huh yeah I'm trying to get that We're fixed probably now. setting in says <laughs> yeah yeah it, on a hardwood floor yeah i mean we had mats but they felt like they felt like hardwood. Yeah. There, I mean, there was no giving them. I mean, no you're, you're sitting, I mean, a lot of Buddhist monks sit in Seiza in Japan, but you have a cushion and mm. a, a Zafu and a Zabuton. You've got lots of cushioning. Mm. And even that can be painful on the front of the thighs. Yeah. The knee's yeah. not too flexed, but it's still, yeah. you know, it's still a certain amount of discomfort. The Japanese like discomfort. I think I, th I think they do, and I think I think I've said this so many times. I think hey, I'm, I'm, I'll be watching this back and kicking myself for saying the same thing. Yeah. But it is a delicate balance because, yeah. as I said on the last uh, session we did together, you know, hardship is a great teacher, mm. but hardship for hardship's sake, with no learning attached to hardship, yeah, is just hardship. Yeah, it's it has no lesson to to yeah teach it. No, I mean, I, that, that, that the, class the japanese are into austerity they you, yeah. you know i remember you know doing karate my karate teacher made us run to the beach barefoot through the streets of south shields in our geese and, <laughs> and, and we'd in the sea would be in the sea i mean i was 12 years old i'm in the yeah. sea doing yakazuki you know and my gettys against the waves mm. and, you know that close to hypothermia yeah. And he'd go on, come on, move your backsides. Right, let's run back to the dojo and do a thousand sit-ups, you know. And you'd be like, oh, my God. Thinks he's back in Japan. Yes, you know, yeah. Standing on that icy waterfalls, you know, doing sanchin and stuff like that. And even, even the meditation systems are very structured and very mm -hmm. rigid. You know, you sit for four hours and your spine has to be straight and the nose has to be dipped down at a certain angle. Seriously. You know, it's very prescriptive, you isn't it? If you wobble, a Kai Shaku comes along and smashes across the back mm. with a with a shin eye. But you bow to him afterwards. You go, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Thanks for that. I think um, 
Yeah. I think what I watched um, a series of videos with one of the, the, the top international um, senseis in, in Aikido recently, uh, talking about the course that I did during that time and the version of the course now and, oh, and, what's, okay. and what's changed. And what I got from, I'm not going to quote him verbatim because it's, it's not fair for me to do that. And this no. is my interpretation of what he said. I think what he, what, he, what he was trying to say was what he meant to say, or what I interpreted, I should say, was that that was a different time. Mm. 13 years ago, 14 years ago was a different time. In the world we live in now, it is not acceptable in most societies to put people through that level of hardship. Mm. It's just not acceptable. No. So, so, the, so the course today, which still runs today, I've not done it today, but I personally believe it's very different to the course I did back then. And probably the course I did was very different to maybe, you know, 1960s, 70s, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, because as a society, we've, we've evolved um, to get rid of that type yeah, of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, like you said, you know, hardship for hardship. So, mm, well, mm. it's a bit pointless. There yeah. are obviously things you know, like putting yourself under stress to achieve mm. something, an end goal is fine. Yes. But it's just for the hell of it. Yeah. But sometimes it always, the Japanese system always smacked of that. I'm it's, trying it's, to get people to detract and say, no, that's not true. But it, my experience of being with, training with Japanese was always, even meditation. I mean, everything from sitting meditation to karate was always about, you know, you've got to suffer a bit. Mm. <laughs> You know, whereas in Thailand, it was more, hey, chill out, man. Yeah, we, we, we're suffering, but it's because we want to get tough to fight, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. The neck's a bit stiff, but it's getting stronger because we've got to clinch, you know. Yeah. There's always a reason behind it, you know. Exactly. There were, there were definitely two types to instructors on, on my course. There were those that delivered hardship because they probably had nothing else to deliver. Yeah. But there were those that delivered hardship because they knew through the journey we'd get something valuable at the end. Yeah. And but, you but, did get something valuable, didn't you? hundred percent. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. I, I got, yeah. a, I got a mindset for life. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a different way, you know, it sounds a bit, it sounds a bit egotistical maybe if that's the right word, but, but this is how, this is how I feel. I, I feel that through that journey, I got a very different way of understanding me, my limitations, how I interact with the world and through that personal journey, which it was a personal journey, I, I got a, a kind of higher level of understanding of how to interact and, and seeing the world through 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 a different lens, yeah. um, if you like. Which I try and I try and bring into my everyday life. And so so um, you know, although I don't practice Aikido anymore, mm. I do practice Aikido in my heart yeah, because Aikido is, yeah. yeah, Aikido is a is a I think it's a principle for life, and yeah. I think what I got from the Senshusei course, did I become a better fighter? Did I become a, a brilliant Aikidoka? No, I didn't. But did I learn to understand myself and others better to improve the quality of my life and the quality of the life of, of those I interact with? Yes, mm -hmm. I think I did. And I think, I think that's an important point because when people stay within their comfort mm -hmm. zone, yeah. uh, they very rarely learn anything new about themselves. Yes. Yes. But you just push them slightly out of it in any direction. And it, it can apply to meditation, Thai boxing, karate. You just that little bit extra effort going outside mm -hmm. your comfort zone, you start to learn things. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, even at a very basic level, like when I started learning Italian two years ago, I thought it's a challenge. I'm going to learn Italian. And, and I don't like, I didn't like learning languages at school. So, for me, it was getting out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. But the moment I did, and I started picking bits of it up quickly, I got better at learning it, you know? Yes. Uh, and now I have a different way of, of looking at languages. I'm mm -hmm. quite keen to now go and explore other languages that I yeah. thought were unattainable. And I think, yeah. I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? You know, I've and it's the same in business. I'm sure you've seen this all the time. Mm -hmm. The people who really succeed are the optimists who go to yes. just push it a little bit further. They'll say, I'm going to take a chance on this. I'm going to take a risk. Yeah. You, you've, got to, you've got to experience, the comfort zone is about, stepping out of your comfort zone is about experiencing a level of discomfort that you experience for long enough to get used to it, to then take another 
level of discomfort. I know, I know, I know. <clears throat> exactly. The, so the, co- the course taught me, taught me a different way of thinking. It also, on a more funnier note, taught me to take one hell of a beating and, and keep coming back for more. Right. Um, but it taught me, it taught me principles. And, you know, one of the principles is in Japanese is nanakorobi yaoki, which means, um, fall, let me get this the right way around. Yeah. Fall down seven times, stand up eight, Yeah. which means you're going to get kicked in the teeth in life. It happens to everybody. Yeah. Um, but, but how you react, it's not what happens. It's how you react. That, um, that really counts. About picking yourself up and then getting on with it. Exactly. Yeah, better to light the candle than a whinge about the darkness. Correct, exactly. <laughs> I said at the beginning. Exactly. Um, we've come to the end of the hour, you know this. And we, we, always, get, we always get there quick, don't we? Yeah, I, I, but, but all the stuff you've been talking about has been absolutely fascinating. It, it's more about the spirit of what was going on, both mm-hmm. from the point of view of your Thai experiences and your Jiu-Jitsu, and of course the Aikido as well. Which, and the Aikido is that thread that runs all the way through it, isn't it? Yes, correct. We haven't even got up to date now with what Simon Gray is doing now, which obviously means we need to do part four. Are you, are you sure you can take another part? <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, if you are, I, yeah, I'm up for it. I'm up for it. I'd, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd definitely like to do part four and bring everybody up to, to bring everybody up to speed with what, what Simon's doing now. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the journey, the journey has continued. Yeah. Life is very different to when I left Japan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd love to. So leave us, leave us on a cliffhanger. Come on. <laughs> leave me on a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh. I guess I, I guess I've got a cliffhanger for you. I've yeah. kind of got an ob- an observation. Okay. Because I always think that life is about. Here, here's the thing. This is very deep. This is very deep. Okay. Wherever we are in life, if we leave ourselves unchecked. And we're honest with ourselves. We either kind of crave the past, or or or, or think, "Oh, I'll be happy when," on and da 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 da. And and the older I've got, I'm 48 now. I'm probably a bit wiser than I was 10, 20 years ago. I've realised that we have these different pockets of experience, pockets of of, of life journeys. And I'm in a, a very different pocket now. I'm married. I've got two kids. And you know, if we have time on the on the next session, you know a guy who studied martial arts for a long, long time since the age of 16 that I have at the age of 48 now brought two young boys into the world. It's about what does martial arts mean for them? And Mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing. And it's, it, 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 it it come waffling a little bit, but it kind of alludes to some of the things you asked me last time about when I was doing my crazy running and the doctor told me to stop. You have to know your limitations. You have to be prepared to pass the bat on. And how do you do that? And how do you best do that and, and be a martial art? Martial arts is for life. It's not just for Christmas, if you like. So maybe we get on something like that. I've not articulated that particularly Martial well. arts is for life and not for Christmas. <laughs> Definitely right. not for Christmas. There you go. You heard it here first. Um, that, yeah, it could be a slogan on a T-shirt. <laughs> that's know. the slogan. That's the slogan. And that's the slogan. You want something up or go home. And on, and on the back, it says, when Sensei says relax, he doesn't mean relax, which is one of the catchphrases of the course. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's your cliffhanger. That's a cliffhanger. There's a story that, I can tell you. I shall leave you uh, in peace and um, look forward to part four, Simon. Perfect. Thanks so much Thanks, for coming Cobb. on, mate. Again. Sorry, Cap. No, sorry, Cap. Cup, Cup. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thank you.